Hello, and welcome to the next instalment of the Law & Order video series, where I unpack and look at stories from games. In this one, we'll be exploring the story from The Evil Within 2. As the follow-up to the very successful first game, this one went for a more open-world feel, but still housed horrifying monsters and another deep story. I did the story explained for The Evil Within 1, so if you haven't watched that one, some of this may be confusing, and the link is up there. There will be spoilers from this point on, so if you haven't played the game, please stop watching now. Ready? Then let's roll the intro. It's been three years since the incident at Beacon Mental Hospital, and Sebastian Castellanos has been drowning his sorrows at a local bar. He wakes after having a nightmare of the house fire which claimed his young daughter Lily. He looks up, and to his surprise, he sees his former partner Julie Kidman there. Sebastian reveals that he's been trying to track her down for the last three years, but Kidman reveals that Lily is in fact still alive, and Mobius faked her death. Kidman reveals that Lily is with Mobius, but that she is somehow in danger. After drugging him, Kidman takes him to a secret Mobius facility where he finds out that Lily is being used as the core, similar to the way Ruvik's brain was, for a newly designed STEM system inside which Mobius have built a picturesque town called Union. The only problem is, Mobius have lost contact with Lily, along with a team of Mobius agents that they sent in, meaning that Mobius have lost control of STEM. At first, hesitant, Sebastian agrees to go into STEM once again in order to save his daughter and make contact with the Mobius operatives. However, it doesn't take long before Sebastian, now inside STEM, comes across more horrifying monsters. He witnesses some sort of photographer taking pictures of himself murdering people and capturing the act in some sort of time loop. This seemingly idyllic town has now become a nightmare, just like Beacon. He comes across a Mobius operative named Liam O'Neill, who gives Sebastian a device that tracks sonic frequencies and residual memories. Sebastian uses this device to track Lily down. He finds that she was running from someone. Eventually, after following the trail, he finds that she was taken by the mysterious photographer from before. The photographer later reveals himself to be a serial killer named Stefano Valentini. Sebastian presses on in pursuit of Lily, and finds one of the Mobius team named Yakiko Hoffman, who explains that Stefano, essentially being a psychopath, gave him some control over STEM, which therefore granted him his powers. Sebastian tracks Stefano down, and after a rather… explosive conversation, Stefano reveals that he took Lily under the orders of someone else, but wanted to use Lily's so-called powers for himself. Sebastian and Stefano fight, and Sebastian kills him. But to Sebastian's pure shock, after the fight, Myra, his wife who has been missing for years, shows up and takes Lily away. Sebastian meets the man who ordered Stefano to take Lily, Father Theodore Wallace. Wallace tries to get Sebastian to join his cause in taking Lily for Myra, due to the fact that Stefano betrayed him. Obviously, Sebastian doesn't trust this weirdo, and refuses, and gets transported to a forest, where he meets a woman named Esmeralda Torres, who informs Sebastian that Myra, Kidman, Wallace, and herself they come up with a plan to break Lily out of STEM and take down Mobius in the process. Later on, whilst trying to track down Wallace, Sebastian comes across O'Neill, who has been brainwashed and corrupted by Wallace. Sebastian kills him, but O'Neill, now aware and free of Wallace's grip, informs Sebastian where Wallace is. Sebastian and Esmeralda launch an attack on Theodore's realm, if you like, but Theodore uses Sebastian's guilt and fear against him. Sebastian shoots Theodore, but it seems that Theodore's appearance was just a hallucination, and it's revealed that he has shot Esmeralda. She manages to get Sebastian to safety, but Sebastian, drifting in and out of consciousness, witnesses Esmeralda fighting with monsters. Sebastian then has a vision of himself being at the family home, and has a conversation with Myra, who tells Sebastian that he can't keep blaming himself for what happened to their family, and that he needs to let it go and focus on saving their daughter. Sebastian then wakes up and finds out that Esmeralda sacrificed herself for their goal, and vows to go on and kill Theodore for what he's done. Heading to Theodore's stronghold, Sebastian and Hoffman use a contraption designed by O'Neill, which helps them travel safely through the fire, but Hoffman is killed. Sebastian fights with Theodore, who is eventually killed by Myra. Myra reveals that she is determined to keep Lily inside STEM for her own safety, and although he doesn't want to, he has to do battle with a mutated Myra, and defeats her, which returns her back to her normal form. So Myra, now free from the clutches of evil, tells Sebastian to take Lily out of STEM. Myra tells Sebastian that she's staying behind in order to take Mobius down from the inside. Kidman is in contact with Sebastian, but the administrator, the guy who is in charge of Mobius, orders Sebastian to be extracted and terminated as soon as he exits STEM, as he has served his purpose in finding Lily, 
and so they can place Lily back into the STEM core. Kidman refuses and fights back. The administrator and all of the Mobius operatives end up dead, having all suffered the same fate. Having saved Lily and Sebastian, the three of them leave the Mobius facility, and after some time, Sebastian and Lily set off to start a new life. Elsewhere, however, one of the STEM terminals starts up, and the game ends. So again, as with the last video on The Evil Within, there's a fair bit to look into and dissect here, so even though we discussed them in the last video, there's more to them here. Let's talk about Mobius. So, somewhat similar to Umbrella in their goals of world domination, and led by the mysterious administrator, Mobius took the initial concept of STEM, designed by Ruben Victoriano aka Ruvik, and further developed it with the vision of creating a unified consciousness. They created Union to be the quintessential small town in the USA, idyllic, and a perfect escape from the real world. But we all know that the roads of Union were paved with the ill intentions of Mobius, who really just wanted control over the masses. It's likely that the people inside STEM, or Union, were people that had been pre-selected or hand-picked by Mobius. According to what Kidman says, Union was designed the way it was in order to keep test subjects calm and relaxed. The difference with this version of STEM, however, is that Union is a city which exists only inside of STEM and not outside of it, unlike Beacon Mental Hospital and areas of Crimson City which actually existed in the real world. Judging by the designs we find in the game, it seems that they had, or were planning to carry on expanding it. And due to the previous events in Beacon Mental Hospital, and due to the fact that the STEM could only have a core as a host with specific brainwaves, Mobius came up with a solution. The Mobius psychiatrist Yukiko Hoffman explains to Sebastian at some point in the game that only a brain with a psychopathic tendency, or on the flip side, a brain with no ego, basically that of a young child, would be suitable to be the core. In the game, it's revealed that Esmeralda Torres, who sacrificed herself to bring down Mobius, reveals from a diary entry that she did something terrible and she feels like she needs to atone for it. But what does she do exactly? Well, after Torres dies, Hoffman explains to Sebastian that Torres was the one who staged the house fire and kidnapped Lily. But why Lily, though? There are plenty of other children in the world. You'll recall in the first game that Julie Kidman was a troubled kid with a juvenile record who was spared jail and given an out by Mobius if she joined their organisation. She agreed, and her first task was to join the Crimson City Police Department and effectively spy on Sebastian Castellanos and Joseph Oda, due to the fact that they were investigating missing persons cases, which would have led them to Ruvik, which would in turn have led them to Mobius. Staging a house fire, staging Lily's death, and later on recruiting Myra into their organisation, and throwing Sebastian into STEM was, to them, the perfect way of obtaining the perfect core candidate and tying up any loose ends in the process. Mobius did become more careful, or at least tried to be. Not wanting a repeat of the Beacon incident, Mobius, or rather Hoffman, started to vet individuals and give them psych exams before allowing them to be part of the STEM experiment. That all went wrong though when these psych exams failed to serve their purpose and people slipped through the net. This leads us on to our next topic. Born in Florence, Italy in 1985, and featured as one of the two primary protagonists of the game, Stefano Valentini was initially a war photographer. He enjoyed taking pictures detailing the horrors of war, until the moment that he captured someone dying in an explosion. This was the turning point for him. The explosion took his right eye and he descended into insanity. Developing an obsession with this kind of imagery, Stefano saw beauty in the exact moment of death and started to try and share his art with the world. However, the world didn't really appreciate his art and admonished him. Unimpressed with their reaction to his work, he started to murder people and created so-called works of art out of their bodies. This is seen through the death of a model called Emily Lewis, who was a friend of Stefano's and he was her photographer. That was until her decapitated body was found in a park in Crimson City. At some point in time, he joined Mobius for the STEM program and was subjected to a psych exam by Hoffman, who was fooled by Stefano. He was a high-functioning psychopath, but due to him being self-aware, he was able to mask it, and as a result, Hoffman declared him sane and a perfect fit for the STEM program. This was largely in part due to his artistic tendencies, which they hoped would transform Union into something more beautiful. Stefano's idea here, though, was to create his works of morbid art free from criticism. At some point during his time in Union, Stefano met Theodore Wallace, who granted him the powers we see in the game, along with a certain amount of control within the world of Union. This would be in exchange for tracking down and bringing him Lily. He is pictured as a smartly dressed man with his hair covering what seems to be a camera in place of his right eye. Through his mind being allowed some semblance of control over Union, he has created a giant camera lens monster called Aperture, 
which summons monsters and an Obscura, a grotesque monster with three legs and a camera for a face. He possesses an ability to create a stasis in reality, a time loop which plays in slow motion, detailing the exact moment of death over and over again, and he calls this his art. Anyway, he went along with Theodore's orders until he realised Lily's true power, being that she is the core, and decided to keep her for his own gain and betrayed Theodore. The second of the game's primary protagonists, Theodore Wallace, was born in 1968 in St. Louis, Missouri, and was the founder of the MU Centers. These MU Centers were a bunch of spiritual well-being centers. Referring to himself as a Sherpa, as well as being a motivational speaker and an author, it didn't take long before controversy began to surround Wallace, as many people saw him as someone who had malicious intentions. It turns out their suspicions were actually correct, as he was a man who surrounded himself with easy to influence people, and people whom he could easily manipulate. Soon enough, however, Theodore joined Mobius and acted as their recruiter. He met Myra, Kidman, and Esmeralda, who all came up with a plot to enter STEM, free Lily, and destroy the organization from the inside. Due to Mobius' policy that all agents have a cerebral chip implanted to prevent defection, Wallace came up with a plan for frying the chips inside their brains in order to kill them all once they had Lily. Kidman reveals during her standoff with the administrator that she had actually removed her chip, which means that the other three likely did the same thing. After Theodore and Myra entered STEM and Union, and after they found Lily, Theodore revealed his true motives. You see, Lily had, think of it like admin privileges. Wallace wanted to take Lily and use her and manipulate her into allowing him to establish total control and dominance over Union. Myra, obviously protecting her daughter, told Lily to run. Theodore says that he will find her, and without Union and STEM having a stable core in place, that in turn leads to Union partially collapsing and destroying itself. Wallace used his mental strength and his powers of manipulation to amass followers who became devoted to him, with the most devout zealots being known as Harbingers, and Wallace set up his own stronghold in Union. This cult is how he met Stefano Valentini, and manipulated the photographer to do his bidding for him in exchange for his powers. But after Stefano betrayed him, Wallace tried to recruit Sebastian, but failed. His MO is that he would prey upon the fears or residual memories of his victims, but is not a fighter himself, which is why he makes Sebastian relive torment from his experience at Beacon, making him fight the Sadist, the Keeper, and Laura Victoriano again, rather than fighting Sebastian in one-on-one -on -one combat. So we know from the first entry in the series that Sebastian's wife Myra used to be his partner and a fellow detective in the KCPD. That was until she was shot while they were working a case. Sebastian proposed and they got married and Lily was born shortly afterwards. Five years later, the house fire occurred. Throwing themselves deep into their work in order to bury their shared trauma despite their marriage falling apart, Myra began working on missing persons cases. The same missing persons cases which were linked to Ruben Victoriano's STEM experiments. She began to uncover evidence that the fire was a targeted attack and their daughter was alive. Sebastian refused to believe Myra, leading them to become even more estranged. It came to a point where Myra left Sebastian a pre-prepared note, stating that her investigations possibly got too close to the truth and that she had either been killed or abducted. At the end of the Evil Within DLC The Consequence, the bombshell dropped that Myra was working for Mobius, even having the mark of Mobius on her hand. It's revealed that Myra had joined up with Mobius after she found out they had Lily. She decided not to tell Sebastian in order to protect him, leaving him to believe that his wife is either dead or is just missing. In the three years between Evil Within 1 and Evil Within 2, she meets up and concocts the plan to save Lily along with Wallace, Kidman and Torres. Then, as we know, Wallace betrays her for his own gain. Her maternal instincts and her desire to protect her daughter whilst also becoming enraged by Wallace's motives turns her into an evil version of herself. Her mark being a white bubbling substance that is encountered throughout the game. This explains the monster called the Watcher. It's essentially a guard dog created by Myra in order to aid her keeping her daughter safe. This all culminated in Myra transforming into the matriarch in one last attempt to stop Sebastian from taking Lily out of STEM. She reverts back to her true self after being defeated by her husband and asks him to do what she couldn't and take their daughter outside of STEM. She explains that the final part of her plan was to replace Lily as the core of STEM and overload the system. So therefore, Myra stays behind in STEM and overloads the Mobius cerebral chips inside all the staff members and operatives' heads. Given that Union completely collapses, it's assumed that Myra is dead. So actually, before we talk about the Lost, let's look at a monstrous being called Anima. Anima is a creature that seems to haunt Union. 
It appears that Anima only targets one person at a time, and as a result is only visible to its victim. This is best seen here when a corpse is pulled through a window and disappears, with Anima not actually being directly visible. Anima, when taunting his victims, seems to torment them with the things that haunt them. In Sebastian's case, it's Beacon. He can't seem to escape it in his mind, so Anima chases him and hunts him through residual memories of Beacon. It seems plausible that Anima appears due to the victim suffering nerve scarring, which explains why only that person sees Anima in its manifested state. This also explains why Sebastian sees Anima due to his mental scarring from his first time inside STEM. He manages to rid himself of Anima when he approaches a version of himself trapped inside Beacon and kills it, I guess overcoming that part of himself still trapped inside Beacon. In a death sequence, upon catching Sebastian, Anima sucks the life form and I'm guessing the soul out of him, leading to him becoming something known as the Lost. The best example of this is when a local priest is seen apologising and repenting in his church and then it turns into one of the Lost. The Lost, as opposed to the Haunted from the first game, are a byproduct of STEM domination by malicious force. It almost seems like people inside STEM are vulnerable to become dominated by a psychological scarring due to their mental state. Sebastian is more strong-willed and mentally hardened than many other people, so he is able to resist STEM corruption more easily than some others. As well as being different in appearance to the Haunted, the Lost seem to be able to regenerate limbs after they've been shot off. Due to their deterioration inside STEM, it seems that they've turned into the Lost as a result of their mental scarring, and it's likely they've been hunted down by Anima, who has sucked the life force out of them. They are almost like workers. They seem to pilot bodies, leading to the creation of a creature called the Guardian. This is the creature that Sebastian meets upon entering STEM, and then continues to attack him throughout the game. There are variants of Lost which Sebastian fights with during the game, such as Hysterics, a shuffling female which attacks at speed when startled, similar to the witch from Left 4 Dead. Disciples, a flame engulfed servant of Theodore Wallace. Gluttons, probably serving as an attack or guard dog for Theodore Wallace. And what is called the Albedo, a slightly stronger and faster version of the generic Lost. So I'm still intrigued by Tatiana. In the first game, she makes an appearance in what is called a safe haven. It's assumed from a missing persons poster in the safe haven that she was a nurse who went missing after a late night shift. She reappears in the Evil Within 2 as well. What's important here, however, is that when Sebastian enters STEM, he arrives in an area separate from the main STEM system. He creates a safe environment from his subconscious which resembles his old office at the KCPD. Upon quizzing Kidman about it, she says that he has imagined it himself. Later on, he sees Tatiana walking towards the mirror in O'Neill's safe house. He follows her and asks what she is doing in this version of STEM. When Sebastian mentions that this is Union and not Beacon, she replies, is it? It's all familiar to me. And for her, it's as if nothing has changed at all. She's just so darn mysterious. I really want to know more about why she is so present in Sebastian's safe area and inside his subconscious. Does her presence bring him comfort due to her being a residual memory of the safe haven in Beacon? But yet here we are, another game goes by with Tatiana being as enigmatic as before, if not more. So that pretty much explains the basis of the game, who everyone is, minus Sebastian of course, as we pretty much know all about him. But there are a few unanswered questions. Here are a few. When Sykes is aided by Sebastian in helping him find an exit door out of STEM, Sykes achieves this but Sebastian finds out afterwards that the chances of getting out are very slim. Despite a 25% success rate, the decision has been made to discontinue research. One in four test subjects made the trip back successfully. The other three simply ceased to be. Failure to get out of STEM this way results in the subject basically dying or ending up in a sub-level of STEM forever. We don't find out what happened to Sykes. Whether he made it out or not is never actually revealed. Given that Myra fried everyone's cerebral chips, it seems that even if he did get out of STEM, it's quite likely that his chip was fried, unless he had it removed, which is unlikely. Throughout the game, Sebastian collects projector slides which prompt him to have a conversation about it with Kidman. One such slide is about his partnership with Joseph Oda. The last we saw of Joseph, he jumped in front of a bullet to save Leslie Withers from being shot by Kidman, seemingly being killed inside STEM and therefore dying in the real world. However, in the conversation with Kidman, she says this. You're the one who actually killed him. No, I didn't. I saw you shoot him, Kidman. I know you did, but... But what? Joseph isn't dead. What? So it seems that Joseph is alive. 
However, Kidman doesn't go into particulars and says it's a conversation for another time. So we don't actually find out what happened to him. And finally, at the end of the game, we see the abandoned STEM terminal in the Mobius facility. But a screen boots up indicating that someone is there or has activated it from within STEM. Could it be Ruvik? I mean, the last we saw of Ruvik, he was walking away from Beacon after implanting his consciousness inside of Leslie Withers' body. Could it be Sykes, who ended up on a sub-level of STEM somehow and is trying to get back out? This is why we need a third game to tie all these ends off and to answer these questions. But anyway, that is it for this one. I hope you did enjoy this video and that it answered any questions you may have had about the plot in this game. I do honestly hope to be able to do a video on a third game of this amazing franchise in the future, but please be sure to drop a like on the video and subscribe, and leave a comment down below with your thoughts. But for now, take care, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.